production of Pioneer Utility Resources. Story Connect, helping communicators discover ideas to shape their stories and connect with their customers. What are some of the questions you need to ask yourself before you start doing any market research? That's what we'll be talking about on this episode of Story Connect Podcast. My name is Andy Johns, your host with Pioneer, and I'm joined on this episode by John Marling, who is the founder and president of Pulse Research. John, thank you so much for joining me. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to get together this afternoon, Andy. Thank you. Absolutely. Now, John, like I said, is founder of Pulse Research. We'll talk a little bit more about that um, in in a moment. They're um, Pioneer's market research partner, and we're excited about everything um, happening there. But John, let's start right where uh, that question kind of opened up, because you've been doing this long enough um, to have, have, have seen the good and bad of it. Um, what are some of the things folks need to consider before they jump in and start doing uh, market research? Great question, Andy. And and we always, and we pride ourselves in getting actionable information that doesn't sit on the shelf. Now, the way we accomplish that is the very first step before we start anything with the research is getting together with you guys and really putting your feet to the fire. What do you want to find out? What do you want to learn? What action steps, what decisions do you need to make, you know, from the research? You know, so that there's a very clear objective and mission so that then when the research is completed, you will have information that, as I said a moment ago, is actionable and usable and meaningful for you. And so we make sure that in that first step, we ask you the question, what do you want to learn? What's most important to you? Do you have any decisions, you know, that your that your board's going to be making? And are there, you know, there's some standard elements relating to, you know, client satisfaction. But in quick summary, we make sure that we clearly identify together what your priorities are, what your needs are, what action you, steps you want to get out of the research. You touched on a lot there, uh, and particularly um, asking what the board might want to know, I think, is this, as a, a, a tip worth coming back to. Um, but I'll preface the, this interview, um, and John and I were talking beforehand, um, in my, uh, my undergrad and graduate program, um, I think I wound up with three C's overall, and two of them were in the two statistics classes that I had to take. So, John, I'm, I'm relying on you for, uh, for quite a bit of this, but that, that's good because when it comes to experience doing surveys, um, you, you've, you've been doing it for a while. Yeah, 39 years, I'm proud to say. Excellent. We've done thousands and thousands of surveys. And speaking of sample size, you know what, you know, in the in this type of research where you want to get some insights to make decisions, to get some clarity in terms of where you stand over all the years, you know, what we've advised, what we found as important is that either ends of the spectrum. In other words, decision making research is what's important. You know, what's okay. the takeaway? And what do I mean by that? What that means is, and I'll just give you for instance. If nine out of 10 respondents to the survey say you're doing a heck of a job, you'd agree with that. That's meaningful, right? Mm -hmm. You know, if one out of 10 or 10% say you're doing a good job, meaning 90% say you're doing a bad job, that is also quite meaningful, isn't it? And, I and so the truth hurts. <laughs> exactly. But at either end of the spectrum is where you make the decisions. Okay. So if, you, if your board is making a decision on a new facility or something, and we've had those questions come up in the research we've done. You know, if nine out of 10 people say stay with and just remodel the current facility, that is obviously insightful, you know, in terms of direction. You know, and but coming back, back to sample size, you don't need for this type of research, you know, a sample of a thousand. Because once again, you're making a decision based on either end of the spectrum. And so many of the, you know, many of the cooperatives have a thousand members. Well, the gold standard in research is 400 completed interviews. Well, you're not going to get 400 out of a thousand, 40% response rate. You know, so we suggest 10%, you know, 10% of your member base, you know, which a thousand, you know, members would be a hundred sample. But if nine, 90 out of those a hundred say you're doing a great job, once again, you're getting the results you want, you know, the insights you want, not the results, but the insights you want from the research. And I think that's a really important piece because like you said, some of the 
some of the co-ops out there, especially you get some, I think in Iowa, there's some that with 700 members. Um, there, there are a lot of them in that, you know, 1,000 to 10,000. And there are some that are huge. There are some with over 100,000. But the research, the techniques, all of that, um, it can be applied whether you're, you're talking about a real small organization or a much bigger one. And absolutely. And speaking of the research, one of the key elements that, you know, we advise on and assist with is making sure that each of your members have a equal opportunity of participating in the survey. And what that means is you don't just, you know, put out one invitation in your newsletter. You use multiple channels available to you. So you're getting a diversity of outreach and therefore getting a diversity of your members, both young, old, you know, members, members who have been a member for a year, members who have been, you know, for 40 years. So you're using all the channels available to you to get a, a valid representative sample response from your membership. Perfect. And I, I think that's important to bring up. I want to kind of shift gears a little bit. So if we're we're talking about, you know, the, the ways to, to promote survey, the audience, the sample size, um, once somebody determines, okay, there's some things that we need to know. And I, I, this is something that, that we have struggled with because every other year we do a, um, a, a pioneer member survey that, that we ask our members and our clients to, mm -hmm. to tell us about. Um, just like anything else, um, one department may have these three or four questions to ask. And then another mm -hmm. department has three or four more. And then, you know, the CEO wants a few more, the board wants a few more. All of a sudden you've got a 50 question survey. How do you, mm -hmm. um, how have you tried to help folks, um, zero in on, on the, the key questions? Uh, is there a magic length to, you know, no, you can't go above X number of questions. And then how do you fight that survey creep? Because sometimes when, when you're asking good questions and other folks may have more, like you're saying, mm -hmm. actionable things they want to do, um, mm -hmm. how do you help kind of uh, keep folks focused on what they want to know for the survey? Once again, a very good question. But in that process of the initial meeting, we establish priorities. You know, what is most important? Because obviously, like you just stated, there's a lot of stakeholders, you know, who want to participate in the survey, obviously, with questions that are germane to them. So one of the things we ask is, have you done a survey before? You know, if they haven't, then we want to touch all the bases. What do we mean by that? You know, you've got questions relating to satisfaction, questions relating to perception, questions relating to needs, demographic questions, et cetera. Communication, which is an extremely important set of questions relating to the takeaways, the action, you know, you know, from, you know, the research. So in answer to your question, Andy, if it's a first time survey, we'd want to make sure and our advice would be, you know, to prioritize and to touch each one of the primary elements, you know, of a survey. If they've done a survey before, what questions you ask before so we can do some benchmarking, you know, to, you know, to your response from before. The other, you know, the good news is though, Andy, this is not a phone survey. You know, in a phone survey, you're severely limited by time, number of questions, okay? Particularly in today's world, you know, you don't do so in phone surveys because nobody wants to answer them. And Pulse was one of the pioneers of doing online research many years ago. And so the good news is when you're doing an online survey, and here's the other positive, in this case, you're doing a survey of those who have a germane interest in the survey. They're members you know, of this utility or their members of this broadband broadband provider. And so they've got a vested interest in doing the survey. So you're going to get a much higher response rate. So we at Pulse are less worried about the number of questions because the people are interested and they will take the time because it's their survey, their utility, et cetera. And, and also, you know, we're... You know, Pulse is not going to limit per se the number of questions. We're going to we're going to do the questions that are needed to get the results that you've prioritized. You know when we have that initial meeting. You know so it could be forty questions, it could be sixty questions, it could be fifty questions. You know the importance here is getting you know asking the questions to get the information that are of a priority for you and knowing where you stand and what decisions you're going to be making, et cetera. Got it. That opens up a few other questions uh, that, that we we haven't talked about before. Um, but are there 
is there a frequency? Can can you over survey? And I know this may be a loaded question for a guy who who makes surveys for a living. Uh, but are you know are they better off if if there are those kind of disparate requests from different departments? Would they be better off doing a number of of short surveys throughout the year instead of one longer one? Or do you hit a point where if you're surveying too frequently, then then the response rate starts to drop? Have you seen um, anything to point you in a direction there? Well, once I get a good question, it goes back to what have you done before? What are your objectives? So, you know, in a in a in a, uh, a pretty first phase survey, you do it maybe a year to two years afterwards, maybe a year to see how you've improved in areas that maybe you were soft. But let's say, you know, a particular client, you know, came to Pulse, this utility had a specific decision or a specific area. Maybe they're thinking about offering a new service, you know. We found out that in that initial survey, you get some pearls of insight that beg a follow-up survey mm. to get more detail. And so it really depends on the client and the focus objective of the research in terms of the follow-up and you know, kind of the frequency thereof. Got it. Okay. You talked about it earlier with um, you know, that a lot of the folks taking these surveys, particularly with the co-op, with the, with the PUD, with, um, you know, a, a telephone cooperative where they are members, they have a, a stake in it. Maybe that's incentive enough. Um, but with, with some of the other surveys you do and, and you see things like contests to, to, you know, win certain things, do you guys normally recommend doing incentives or, or what, yeah, does that even, help? At even though of all the different types of research Pulse does, this is the one that is, how should we say easier? Because they have a stakeholder, they they are members, and I want to put it out. I've been a, I've been a member of a a, a, a utility co op for about forty nine years. That's right. You know I firsthand. Would love, I would love it if they would do a survey. I would immediately fill it out. But you know the you know either good, bad, and different. You know I you know I'm a member. The sure. bottom line is it's my utility. Okay. But to answer your question, we normally suggest you do a thank you, an appreciation. You know, a, you know, a drawing for, you know, maybe a Visa card, $100 Visa card or or something that's universal, maybe $100 in groceries or something, just to say thank you. We appreciate you being a member. We appreciate you being a client customer and for tell, and taking the time. It's it, it would be less important in this case to enhance response, but I think it's important to say thank you. We appreciate you being a member, a customer, you know, of us. Perfect. So as we're kind of doing an overview of the surveying process here, um, are there things that um, that you've seen, and maybe it was early in your career and, and you've learned those lessons now, are there some common things that, that kind of lead to those follow-up surveys or that people do the survey and then they wind up thinking, oh, I wish we would ask about this or wish we would have asked about that. Uh, what are some of the common things that, that come up that you're able to help folks realize, now before we launch this, don't you want to consider A, B, and C? I think in response, I'm, if I'm understanding your question. It was not my best question, to be clear. It's <laughs> a little intimidating asking that, questions to a person Every who, survey who we've done, questions. thousands of surveys we've done, there's always, every single time, been an, oh my gosh. And mm -hmm. I call those pearls, things that you don't expect. Okay. And also in the surveys we do, there's a lot of reinforcements. Well, we thought that, and now it's nice to have that reinforced. Okay. So now in response to your question, in those ahas that come up, those pearls, that's in the where they normally clients want to follow up and get more detail, get more insight, get more depth, you know, to take an, an applicable response. Because in the first time you do a survey, it's the broad brush. You're getting feedback on satisfaction, perception, needs, you know, communication, you know, you know, type relating questions, effectiveness of communication. And then when you go on maybe a phase two, you dive deeper because of what you learned from the first level. True. You know, so that's, you know, and so, yeah, and every single time we find out the ahas, we point out, here's what we, we recommend you do about it. And it ends up being a very, very positive because it helps them overcome a weakness and turn it into an opportunity. You mentioned another example was about a facility being built. And again, we don't want to identify anybody, but but are there any other examples for the kinds of things that the utility organizations have, have wanted to know about? 
Well, you know, at a board level, you know, I, I, you know, made presentations of the results of the utility survey to the board. And I think that has been very positive for, for all the stakeholders involved, because number one, it reinforced in this case that the satisfaction of the services was overwhelmingly positive. But number two, it pointed out some areas that, of softness that the board was very, very positive to find out. You know, they could respond. And then, of course, in all the surveys we do, we ask what decisions you need to make, what decisions you have on the horizon in terms of services you're thinking about or offering or facilities, you know, that we've asked about here. Um, you know, there's a range of, how should we say, as as the utility industry looks forward in time, a balance of renewable versus legacy power power sourcing. You know, so questions relating querying their membership as you look into the future. What are they willing to pay for, not pay for? You know, what are they willing to commit to, et cetera? So at a board level, those are phenomenally beneficial insight. Well, and what I'm thinking about it before I forget, one of the things that we do in the survey is ask a couple of open-ended questions. Oh, okay. And oh my gosh, oh my gosh, Andy, <laughs> do they do they open up? And that's one of the benefits of doing an online survey. When you're doing a phone survey, you're limited in time. But an online survey, you ask an open question about, you know, what do you think about X, Y, Z? And let them just respond. Just go away on their, you know, on their little keyboards. It is awesomely insightful to really digest and and really analyze, you know, the gist of the, you know, of the, you know, of the open-ended responses. Well, and that's interesting. And I'm glad that you, excuse me, I'm glad that you took us there because uh, having done a few very basic surveys, not anything to the level that, that you guys do, but, you know, you can see a shape um, on the, the the curve on the responses to be uh, to be positive or, you know, whatever, it's whatever it's showing. Um, it's easy with the, uh, the quantitative numbers that are on there, um, mm -hmm. but it can be tough to me when you, the open-ended responses um, you know, it can show that, like you said, nine out of 10 are really happy with this, but one comment down there, uh, in the open-ended part that says, you know, is there anything else you'd like to add? Um, this negative, sometimes that rings louder in our ears than what the statistics would show up, up <laughs> above. So, so, and maybe that's just the questions not being crafted <laughs> properly when I've done it, but how do you weigh that? How do you weigh though, um, open-ended requests? versus the the bigger picture statistical um, data coming in from the survey? It's through experience, recognizing that people are people and some people are overly positive, some people are overly negative. Mm -hmm. and, and so you've got to be able to sort out, you know, as, as you're analyzing the open-ended responses to really identify the true meaning. And then, and this is important also, then you then you qualify that or correspond it, correlate it to, you know, the specific data set relating to satisfaction scoring like one out of five. And, and so there's no clear cut, Andy, you know, how, how do you, it's, it's based on the experience and knowing that, that human beings will be there. There's a group who over, are over positive, a group who are over negative, and you've got to sort through that and then compare it to, you know, the statistical, you know, results and come up with a recommendation. But I'll tell you, the clients love the open-ended responses. I'm sure. I'm sure that kind of puts puts flesh on it uh, for sure. Um, well, John, just a couple of other uh, final questions for you here. Um, what are some of the trends? Obviously, you've been doing this almost 40 years. Um, what are some of the things that are different about surveying and doing um, member research, market research now? Um, you know, is, uh, is everybody's attention span really short as, as we think? Or what are some of the trends and changes? And, and maybe where even do you see it going? Just as you've, as you've seen the changes in the way that we, we do market research or, or people's attitudes towards it. I think I think in response to that, Andy, is there's a lot of, and I'll be quite blunt, a lot of entities who think they know it. Mm. They know that they know their audience, <clears throat> they know their members, et cetera. And the reality is, in today's world, it's a very complex world, they unfortunately don't. Mm. 
And so I, I mentioned a moment ago in, in terms of, the, in response to your question, the importance, the reason to doing research today is you're going to be, re, you're going to get reinforcement, you know, to those areas you think, you know, well, I thought we knew that and it's been reinforced. So, you know, then, then that, that management team or the board is much more confident to move forward. Mm-hmm. But then there's always the ahas, the unknowns, you know, that that you learn from that research, you know, moving forward and then taking it to the next level. And I've thought a lot about this because our commitment is to actionable information, to be a real catalyst, your know, partner, not with just pioneer, but with individual utilities to be able to provide information, to be able to, to be able to assist in the communication to those members, you know, being a member of a co-op, it's important. You know, for me, you know, to and I was doing a presentation a, bit, a while ago to to a, to a board of one of our you know, utilities. We just completed the research, and I've been a member of this co-op for you know almost fifty years. And what I was shocked to find was in in the presentation of the board that there is a high probability of of electrical outages that there isn't a reliable reliability of power sourcing. And there could potentially be rolling brownouts. And I go, oh my gosh, I mean, what does that mean to me at my, you know, you know, co-op? Point being is in response to your question, in today's world, you can't think things for granted and you've got to have an eye to the future because the world is changing. And, you know, power sourcing, the balance of green versus legacy, you know, power source, very important. But what the real element here is, well, the real takeaway is, Andy, how do you communicate that? How does that public utility, the co-op, you know, communicate to its members, you know, not only the power of reliability, but, you know, a fee increases, price increases. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's why I think it's really important in answer to your question is you, 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 you find out so you can be able to and this is important. Tell your story. That's what, you know, Pioneer is all about. You know, tell your I've heard, story. I've I mean, heard that a time or two before. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the research is discover your story. Mm-hmm. Discover your story so you can communicate that story. I mean, that's critically important because members, you know, of these, it's their utility. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yep. And they and, and they feel that the utility board, that utility uh, leadership you know, has a responsibility to communicate, you know, to them. And so in response to your question, I think it's more important than ever for, you know, those reasons, you know, to be, to reach out and not just assume, you know, but to find out, you know, from your members where you stand and also dip your toe into the future. So you're able to effectively communicate. Perfect. I like that a lot. Um, Last question I have for you. Obviously, I would love love folks to go pioneer.coop slash surveys. Uh, you'll get a link to case studies and the other information to get in touch with uh, with us and with John and everybody, pioneer.coop slash surveys. Um, we would love for them to do the market research um, with us, with you through this partnership. But whether they do or whether they don't, um, what's the advice that you would have for somebody who's um, who's looking to do market research, who's looking to know a little bit more about their story, like you were saying? What are some of the things that they they need to keep in mind for that. Like, like we like, and I think it's worth restating. What do you want to learn? Know what the actionable areas of information before you start, because the worst thing that happens is you just, you know, do the research, the time, effort, expense, and it just sits on the shelf. You know, in this world today, it's too important. You have to know. And so if, and when you do it, Make sure you have clear-cut objectives that your whole team is on board in what you want to get out of the information so that you do, in fact, take action from it. And that's the mission of Pulse, is, is to provide information that gives you that insight, that gives you, you know, that reinforcement, if you will, in that areas of aha that you didn't know those pearls to take action. Perfect. That's uh that's good advice from a, a a long career of of doing this sort of thing. So be good uh would be good for for us to take heed. John, thank you for joining me. And thank you, Andy. I appreciate the partnership. He is John Marling. He is the uh, founder uh, of Pulse Research, founder and president. Um, 
I'm your host, Andy Johns with Pioneer. And until we talk again, keep telling your story. Thanks, Andy. Story Connect is produced by Pioneer Utility Resources, a communications cooperative that is built to share your story. Story Connect is engineered by Lucas Smith of Lucky Sound Studio.